So I just wanted to let you know right off the bat that we're not setting anything on fire. <laughs> building a whole rope bridge to do the end of cliffhanger jump on the mountain pass as the rope bridge gets severed by explosives. And we are doing a James Bond bit, so I started this day in an evening gown. <laughs> I started this day in an evening gown. It's Still evening. Too many jokes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So uh, we're going to get to some of the questions that have been asked. I couldn't possibly have uh, chosen all of them. There was a stack this thick on my kitchen table. It's very painful choosing a small subset. So I'm going to go with a question from a sixth grader at Wells Middle School. Are there any Wells Middle School students here? Marlena asks, Dear Mythbusters, what did you want to be when you grew up, and what inspired you to be scientists? P.S. I'm a big fan, and thank you for coming to my hometown, Dublin, California. Marlena describes you as scientist. Do you consider yourself what you do, science or just determined curiosity? Isn't it the same thing? Uh, the only difference between, this is a, a ballistics expert, Alexander Jason told me this last week. The only difference between science and screw it around is when you write it down. <laughs> um, I can tell you that I had two early dreams uh, when I was a kid. The first job I ever wanted was to be a designer for Lego. I mean, I had, I had, Lego's the greatest toy ever invented, and I had cities, I had economies of Lego in my room, and I had Legos, I mean, I had like a Lego spaceport, this is all in the 80s when they just started to break out and do really cool stuff. I had Legos until I discovered girls at like 20. <laughs> uh, and the other thing I wanted to do was work on, work on Star Wars. Star Wars came out when I was 11 years old. Uh, it was a totally pivotal <laughs> moment for me, and uh, when I was 18, my best friend at that time was telling me why I was uh, a screw-up, and he was saying, your problem is that you have talent but no ambition. He was totally right, by the way, at that point. He said, you have talent but no ambition. If you had ambition, you wouldn't be here in my bedroom talking to me about this stuff. You'd be saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Lucas, I can't do that by Tuesday. <laughs> so cut to... Uh, 17 years later, I was working up at the Lucasfilm Ranch in the art department on episode two, and I got to actually say, I'm sorry, Mr. Lucas, I can't do that by Tuesday. <laughs> I called him right away. When <laughs> Star Wars Lego came out, was that like the best day of your life? 100%. <laughs> Many students, uh, including Michelle, a seventh grader from Fallon Middle School. Anyone from Fallon in the audience? <laughs> Ask questions like this. What is the inspiration for the ideas, for the experiments you do? You do so many cool ideas that I would never have thought about before. So where do you get all the inspiration? Well, we're very lucky that we have a lot of our audience participation and we have a message board that we get a lot of our myths from. Most of the myths that we get are actually from the people who watch the show. We get them from you guys. You send them in and you, uh, we put them in the hopper and just wait for the right time to actually test them. Uh, we started out using books and then the internet and mostly we just use you guys now. I was at an appearance a few weeks ago and some like 12 year old kid stood up and goes, you know that myth that saying, I know it like the back of my hand? Why don't you guys test that? And I was like, I have no idea why we haven't tested it. <laughs> it's on our list, we're gonna do it, it's gonna be awesome. Uh, also, I want to go back and talk about the scientist thing. You know, I went through, we never intended to make a show, none of us intended to make a show that was educational or interesting to children. <laughs> and I think that's why children like it, because they can tell that we're not trying to pander to them. Um, and for a long time, you know, Jamie and I joke, and I know you guys do too, about having no background in science. Jamie's got a degree in Russian studies, and I have a high school diploma. But, Honestly, after meeting all the scientists that we get to meet and work with on the show over the years, I do think that we're scientists. We think methodically and critically through problems that we've got to solve. And that is the simplest definition of being a scientist. So I, I think we all do get to hold that title. I need to move over to Dublin High and get a question from Dublin High. So Jessica, freshman from Double High Wonders, how much research do you guys do before you do an experiment? And building on that question, Madison, Danny, Aaron, and Johnny, were group questions too, all eighth graders from Fallon Middle School wrote, what do you guys do on set when you aren't filming? Is it all work or do you get to fool around? You know, talk about a typical day if there is such a thing, preparing and filming for Mythbusters. 
Well, uh, you know, we actually have quite a bit of research that goes into each of our myths, and we have a research team of, uh, you know, uh, a couple people over at our shop, a couple people at Jamie Adams' shop, and some people in Australia who are, you know, go through months of research to get to the point where we actually are testing the myth. You know, we, we all sit down in a meeting and, and talk it through and, and come up with the ideas for the actual experiments, but all the research and background that goes into it is extensive. Well, and it depends. Sometimes we have we have uh, you know unforeseen events that cause us to stop producing for a couple of days, when we get sick, or something like that. Um, so we might have to change our schedule. A, couple, a few weeks ago, we had to do a story in five days. Normally, we take about nine days to do one. So we busted one out of the list that was just something that I wanted to try. And we did it in five days with almost no research. But I can tell you, lead balloon. Or Jamie and I built a 14 foot diameter balloon out of lead that floated with helium. Uh, it was two and a half years to find a factory that could roll lead to the thinness that we required. Really, I mean, two other factories actually broke their equipment trying it. So we left this wake of destruction on our way to try to find that. And also, regarding, regarding fooling around when we're not shooting, one of the greatest things in the world is to have a high speed camera to play with. <laughs> and so we will go down to the shop and do things like throw water balloons in each other's faces to watch what happens. <laughs> and for the record, getting hit in the face with a water balloon is pretty much like getting punched in the face really hard. It's no fun at all. You did that to Jamie? No, no. No, Matt did that to me. Okay. <laughs> that would be certain death, I'm pretty sure. You like this. Oh, that really hurt. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that really hurt. watch everything you drank from then on. <laughs> we have a prank they taught on Mythbusters. We, we don't prank, we, none of us prank each other because it's it's like a mutually assured destruction. It's totally not true. Tori and Grant prank me all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I can't tell you how often I have thrown up. Not on camera. Just saying. I saw the saliva one. That made me throw up. <laughs> You know, one thing I've uh, watched a bunch of interviews that you've given, and one thing you both have in common is prior experience working with your hands, something that seems to be unfortunately leaving the school system. The uh, shop class that I had doesn't seem to exist anymore. You know, uh, Adam, how's your experience as a practical effects artist? And Carrie, how has your work as a sculptor been applied to Mythbusters? Um, well, you know, I started out, I've always made things. I, my father was an artist, he was a painter, he was an animator, and he gave me access to his charge account at the hardware store from the time I was 13. And I never abused it, actually. I never said anything on, I, I was actually able to put out all the fires before anyone noticed. Um, so I was always encouraged to make things. While I did do a stint of some acting as an as a older child, um, I, I loved making. I got into the theater industry, which is a great ground floor for learning how to do just about everything. That led to the film industry. And I love special effects in film because you were building something different every single day with problem solving constantly. Uh, and I thought that I came to Mythbusters with some skills. But when you are problem solving, you are thinking scientifically. I mean, making stuff is problem solving. A craftsman, and I'm sure there's more than a few in this room that know this, a craftsman isn't someone who doesn't make mistakes. They can just smell them coming from farther away than you can. And they can change and move and stop and, you know, avert them. Uh, so that has deeply affected how we, how we work on Mythbusters, and it's one of the reasons we're, everyone thinks that we have like a lot of people building stuff for us behind the scenes, and we really don't. There's like three guys, and the rest is everything you see us build, we all build. Uh, for me, having a background in art, I think, helped me immensely become someone who really likes science, because I uh, started to approach it in a very Mythbusters way. Um, I really like just getting my hands dirty. And that's the kind of science that I like to do. And I never realized how much I was going to like science until I started approaching it like art. You know, just digging in, doing things that made messy. And, and you just have to work your way through a creative process to get to the answers. I, I also think that that's one of the loveliest things about what we've learned on the show, what we've learned on the show, is that science is a messy thing. And it's confusing and concerning. And, also in that step of the scientific method that says form a hypothesis, which is what our meetings are all about when we're doing story meetings. Like, how do we do this? What can we expect to see here? That form a hypothesis part is the most deeply creative thing there is. 
and trying to, you know, you come up with one, you come up with another, or you're arguing it out with, you know, the other Mythbusters, and you come up with five, five more, and it, it's a self-generating thing. It's deeply creative. You know, you filmed over 50 episodes in and around Dublin. Raise your hand if you've recognized a street name or a location in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> this is like our second shot. <laughs> Um, and you're a senior at Dublin High School wondered, how much of a factor are local resources like the bomb range and testing mist? For example, are there mists you can't do because you just can't find the right place with the right specifications? Sooner or later, we seem to find the right place. You know, we are very, very lucky to be filming the Bay Area because we have just such a wealth of things to, to pull from. And Dublin in particular, the bomb range has made it possible for us to do so many things that we couldn't do anywhere else. You know, also, it, the relationships that we have is a really good question. Um, one of the things that we do when we sit down and have a story meeting is we plot out what, what we think is going to happen in the episode, and then we come up with a set of experiments, and you know, you, it doesn't ever go like we planned. It doesn't, I can't stress that enough, it doesn't ever go like we planned. So we plot out, we book locations based on what we expect to happen, and then an experiment yields a different result, and all of a sudden we need a new location that day, and it's the relationships we have with people around the Bay Area, from our guy who runs the Alameda and Hunters Point shipyard, Jamie and I spend all day today up at the Mare Island shipyard, uh, the, the Bomb Ranch, these locations are, and the relationships, the personal relationships we have with those locations are, allow us to be so quick on our feet that the show really is as haphazard as it looks on television. <laughs> it, there's, no, there's no artifice to it, and I really like that. Uh, sixth grader Gianna at Fallon Middle School is interested. If you've ever been too scared to do an experiment, if so, which one and why? How did you overcome the fear? And Carrie, I was watching a, an episode with my daughter Evelyn, who's sitting in the front row, a huge fan. And uh, it was the uh, episode where we were doing the Chinese water torture, and I was pretty convinced that that was not pleasant. Uh, talk a little bit about things you've been too afraid to do, or things like Chinese water torture, which maybe you regretted doing afterwards. I regretted Chinese water torture before we did it. <laughs> I, I thought it was a terrible idea, but I was pretty new to the program, and I was just like, all right, you guys must know what you're doing. Wait a minute. Terrible idea. If we prove this, wouldn't it be torture? No? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, you know, generally, we overcome our fear because we all, um, it's, it's, it's almost like being dared by a sibling to do things. Then you'll end up doing it sooner or later. It's rare that we're actually too afraid. Have you been afraid, too afraid to do an experiment? There's one. What? Uh, there's this myth that a truck full of liquid oxygen is driving uh, down the highway and it gets compromised and spills locks, what they call liquid oxygen, all over the roadbed. Now, oxygen makes things burn, one of the key components. Uh, liquid oxygen makes things burn like you have no idea. Uh, so the myth is that the liquid oxygen on the petroleum-based asphalt turns the entire road into a bomb. So we looked into this. We started experimenting with little amounts of liquid oxygen, enough to discover that liquid oxygen is the scariest stuff on the planet. It really will turn an oily rag into a high explosive, and that is no hyperbole there. And it also does it not predictably. Which makes it twice as scary. So, and so the, the, the cost of not being predictable is such that either you end up with an episode where nothing happens and no one wants to go near the place where nothing's happening. <laughs> or you blow up way much more. And what happens when you release a cloud of oxygen, of pure oxygen? What does it float down to the freeway and all of a sudden everyone's cars accelerates to like 100 miles an hour? <laughs> the, the, it, it is a great story and it is one that we'll just never do. <laughs> <laughs> we have some very avid robot makers in the audience today. Can you raise your hands or give a cheer if you're a robot maker? Robot. So Adam, tell me about what you learned from Jamie's robot, Blendo. Has anyone heard of Blendo? If you haven't, definitely Google and YouTube it. And then Carrie, I understand you were able to MC a competition in the yeah, robot world. Yeah, I I got to MC the VEX World Championships in Disney World. It was amazing. Kids from all over the world filled just this huge auditorium, and it was just seeing that many bright kids that were way smarter than I am 
running around making these robots and do such incredible things, I was impressed. And in fact, I think there's a team over here, from the best team over here. Yeah. Yeah. These are some of the bright kids I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, way back when, when I was first working for Jamie Heineman in 1992. Wow, yeah. Uh, uh, Jamie said, oh, I've heard about this thing called Robot Wars, that this guy Mark was starting. And we were part of the very first Robot Wars. And Jamie had this idea that, he's like, I want to build a robot that no one else is thinking about. That's actually one of Jamie's primary modes of thinking. What can I do that no one else is thinking about? Which means that half of his ideas are so harebrained you fear for his sanity, and the other half are so brilliant you fear for yours. Uh, so he came up with this idea of taking a, a, a basically an upside down walk and spinning it to like 30,000 RPM, and then allowing the centrifugal energy of its spinning to run it. It wouldn't need an engine in his mind. It would just, you'd set it free and it would run for the five minutes of the competition. Um, so he called a friend of his physicist and the friend said, uh, if you got it spinning that fast, the steel would burst into flames from friction with the air. <laughs> in fact, the whole thing might just go pop and it just blow up. Um, so he, he scaled it back to 400 RPM. And Blendo is an upside down walk on a flywheel spinning at about 75 miles per hour. Uh, and it had two horns on it. And each horn was a piece of hard steel, tool steel. And the force that Blendo delivered was equivalent to a piece of steel the size of your fist going the speed of sound. No, it was shocking. Uh, we passed all the safety tests, but each, each match lasted five seconds. It was Blendo enters the arena and tries to steer, which Blendo was not very good at it, but it didn't matter. Opponent enters and touches Blendo, opponent completely decimated. <laughs> and, and in four out of our five matches, pieces of Blendo flew over the 10-foot barrier and into the audience. <laughs> into, I think, the laps of insurance claims adjusters because we were disqualified from fighting but awarded first prize in lieu of competition two years in a row. <laughs> And say, please go home. And we were like, yeah, that's how it's done. <laughs> Actually, if you've ever seen the television show BattleBots, that arena has a top on it because of us. <laughs> uh, several students were also interested in your crash dummy, Buster. Now, I want everyone to know, I requested that Buster attempt. And the producers of Mythbusters said, unfortunately, he's unavailable. He's filming a night show tonight. So, and he also uh, would be a lot of things that he is in pieces right now. <laughs> he's also heavy. And I'm going to interrupt you. We want to do this story. It's going to be a story we will do. You know, in movies, somebody kills a guy, and then he takes the body, wraps it in carpet, and throws it in the trunk of his car. Yeah. No way. No way. There's a reason they call it dead weight. And bodies are one of the hard. Jamie threw his back out trying to move one of our simulates a couple of years ago. It, Bodies are ridiculously heavy. It's just not feasible. We're going to do it. So Buster's, he's heavy. When I used to fix Buster all the time, I actually got pinned underneath him until somebody came to find me. Because I couldn't get him off me again. Buster had to take some... <laughs> had to take some classes after that to harass him. <laughs> that was not worse. I just came up with that. We had a whole bunch of questions on the Bermuda Triangle. Here's just one of them. Anna, a sixth grader at Wells Middle School, asked, have you or will you ever do a myth on the Bermuda Triangle? And if you would test one, which would it be? NPS, you guys are awesome. I want a Bermuda Triangle so bad. It's on the list. Um, there's, several, there's several theories about how the Bermuda Triangle might work. That I, there are large methane bubbles coming up, bubbling up from the oceans bottom can actually cause a ship to sink. There was a program that did it, they did it really poorly and thought their methodology was super sloppy. Not that ours is always really nice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's been, the Bermuda Triangle, theories about the Bermuda Triangle have been on our list for a long time because they're quite testable. Besides that, unfortunately, you know, it falls into the Loch Ness Monster territory. We can't actually imitate large weather patterns, but we'll test good theories. And I'm lost like this much there were other questions about ghosts and paranormal, and you don't seem to cover those. Talk about why. You can't really test them. 
<laughs> you can't you can't test a negative. What, everything we do requires us to be able to. And we learned this really early on. Actually, we tried to test. Oh, is Buster dead or alive? Well, what is dead or alive? Well, actually, that turns out to be this very very weird window that's hard to define because it means so many different things under different circumstances. So we've learned that what we want to know is Buster more or less injured under these circumstances. It's always relative. And this is like the soul of science, is the relative, you know, the relativity between one thing and another. Um, and we always want to test a control against anything that we're testing. We want to compare it to something. All you've proven if you go and look for ghosts and don't find them is that you don't know how to find ghosts or they don't exist. We believe the latter, we leave it untested. It's, we're not going to prove a negative, we're not going to look for Bigfoot, the Yeti, the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah, that's, that's, that's for some other shows. But we have been testing spontaneous combustion for the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Drummers. Uh, you got a chance to walk by the duct tape suspension bridge while we're going over to the and uh, that was clearly inspired by a, uh, a myth, so you've done a lot of duct tape myths. What's been the most challenging slash fun duct tape myth you've done today, and do you plan to do any more? Challenging. What was your most challenging duct tape myth? Well, the new season of Mythbusters starts in March. Yes! For the kickoff episode, we called it Duct Tape Island. Jamie and I had to, we got stranded on a, stranded, it's not a reality show. We got stranded on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. <laughs> and we had, to, we had to survive, thrive, and eventually escape using nothing but a pallet full of duct tape. And in the end, we, we built and attempted to escape in a 21-foot outrigger canoe made of duct tape. <laughs> Yeah. Built, built in a day, which I have to tell you, um, my fingertips were bruised from tearing Where thousands of people. <laughs> I was here. It was raining. So one tough shoot. Yeah, I recall an episode up in the snow, in like four feet of snow, and I think the myth was bouncing a uh, oh, okay. uh, uh, a, a bullet, a bullet. spinning bullet. What's the least favorite location? Maybe that's the one that that's you've had to shoot in. That they didn't even make it look as bad as it was. No, I mean, the, we did the Smith spinning ice bullet, and you shoot into the ice at a certain angle, and the bullet just spins. Now, it seemed like such a silly little myth until we had to actually find a place to do it. And it snowed. It snowed sideways at 60 miles an hour down on a frozen lake that we had to dig out continually so that we could film. And not only did we actually have to snowshoe our way in, but we didn't bring enough snowshoes, so we had to snowshoe all the equipment in, bring the snowshoes back to the next person, so they could snowshoe their way in, and we had to walk in each other's footprints, and it, the snow literally got up to chest high. They sent pictures back to us of them walking in single formation, holding on to each other, so that they could, because it was getting dark, and they had to get back to the hotel. I have to say, one of the hardest things it turns out to actually find to film scientifically with is a freaking frozen lake. <laughs> they're really hard to come, I know they happen all over the place, but finding one where we can go like shoot bullets is really difficult. <laughs> On that particular shoot, our cameraman also, I think he had like, walking pneumonia, and <laughs> our Saudi had to constantly clear the snow out of, of her sound equipment, so the whole time we're like, I don't know if we can even hear this. It was miserable. Yeah, we've, we've filmed now in 118 degrees, we've filmed 45 degrees below zero. We've run the full gamut at this point of, of uncomfortable and difficult situations. You've challenged some deeply entrenched myths, and one of my favorites is a myth about a ringing cell phone can start a fire with pumping gas. Have you ever challenged uh, myths where government regulators and the scientific community start calling you and saying, what the heck are you up to? Well, actually, I mean, quite the opposite on that one. Uh, we got figures. Okay, so gas station fires happen very rarely. Like 100 billion people fill up their gas every year, and there's like seven fires a year at gas stations from static electricity. But since that episode of Mythbusters aired, it's now like three a year. So we've, we've got it in half. What about explosive decomposition? 
compression. Explosive decompression. Um, so that was the myth we did, where shooting a bullet through the side of an airplane won't make you know that you could like everything gets sucked out of a tiny hole. Um, and we went down to Mojave and we did it. The, the most response that I get from that is air marshals who find me in the airport no matter where I am. Not like you, buddy, air marshal. Um, and then they thank me for that episode because they say their wives, it's funny, it turns out the wives of air marshals don't like flying because they know someone on the plane has a gun, even if it's their husband. <laughs> and they said after watching your episode, they were totally cool about being on an airplane. <laughs> uh, but, uh, sorry, I was going to say about the cell phone destroys gas station. Um, the stickers here in California now specifically say that an excess static buildup can cause a, a fire. And I, I believe that's directly because of the clusters. So, so what does cause those sparks? If it isn't cell phones, that didn't make sense. What does cause the fires when they rarely occur? Well, if you're moving around on your fabric and you get a static spark and you can feel from, you know, a centimeter away, well, the resistance of air is 10,000 volts per centimeter. So that static spark is a 10,000 volt spark. Um, we show that that's plenty under the right conditions for the right stoichiometry to ignite gas fumes. Absolutely. Getting in and out of your car, moving around. So yeah, moving around your car, you can actually build up 20 to 30,000 volts of static electricity. Going back to Dublin High School, Janik, here in the audience, here's your question. This is a very broad question. What were your dreams as a child? I can't believe you all wanted to, wanted to end up in the job you are now, even though it's an awesome job. <laughs> Adam already told us what his yeah. dreams were. Um, I wanted to be a working artist, and uh, that's actually how I got into this job, is I went to get an internship with Jamie at M5 Industries because it was a way to actually be a sculptor in a, a practical way. He was toy prototyping and doing props. I basically wanted to be Adam when I grew up, because I'm much younger than him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't realize that this was my dream job until I started going home at night and telling my boyfriend, now husband, how excited I was about what we were doing, even if it was, you know, handling excrement. I'd be like, this was the coolest day! I think you might have, this is not your day job. This is your dream job. So, just, you know, my dream job found me. You know, I, I grew up, like I said, my dad was an artist. Um, he was something that, he was a terrific example for me because he had worked in advertising, in serious advertising, like the generation just after Mad Men in the late 50s and early 60s. And he got out of advertising before I was born and raised us doing these little animated spots for Sesame Street. Little things that happened between the segments on Sesame Street, like, you know, squares, counting, stuff like that. Um, and so I grew up with the example of someone who only did what they really wanted to do and they figured out a way to make it work. And some years they made $5,000, and in other years they made a lot more. But they really, our childhood was very even. Uh, and so for me, it's not, I thought about a lot of different things I wanted to do, but the best part of about my parents' encouragement was I felt like any of them was possible. And I, you know, that you could actually make a living doing something that you really liked. Just a couple more questions, and then we're going to let you all enjoy the wonderful displays that are behind you. Um, Nathan, a freshman at Dublin High School, wrote, have you ever accidentally invented something while testing a myth? And building on that question, what has surprised you the most during filming? And I'm thinking of elephants and mice as one example. You know, actually, I have a new one that's the most surprising. We, we, did, the, we did this myth about called blind driving. And the myth is that a guy gets so drunk, he convinces his blind friend to drive him home <laughs> while he gives directions. So we went actually out here to Dublin Pleasant to Evoc Range, and Jamie and I took turns. One of us was blindfolded and driving, the other gave instructions. And we did okay at it. We knocked over a few cones and everything. Then we went down to this place we all call Zombie Town, which is this abandoned military community down in Monterey, which is where we filmed a whole bunch of stuff. And we got an actual blind guy. Now, this is the greatest part. One is the actual blind guy was a far better driver than Jamie or I blindfolded. <laughs> but here's the reason, he had no preconceptions. He, his existence is based on getting feedback. So when you tell him, turn left, move the steering wheel to the left until I say stop, he just does it. And Jamie and I have this map of the world in our heads and we're constantly trying to adjust for it. So the blind guy turned out to be a terrific driver while Jamie was giving him instructions. 
the single most amazing thing that none of us possibly was even remotely possible was that when Jamie then got drunk, he made the blind guy drive like a drunk person. <laughs> like, weaving all over the road, going fast and going slow. It was unbelievable, it was uncanny. And Jamie got out and he was like, I thought that went really well. <laughs> One of my favorite results we ever got. All right, I'm going to finish off with a question that was in many of the sheets that we got, high school, middle schools, and that, you've already given one example of the duct tape uh, episode that you're working on. What other things can we look forward to that you're allowed to share without breaking confidentiality agreements? Right now, I'm working on something that I think is so awesome. It involves dragons. We're actually uh, <laughs> doing the Chinese fire dragon, uh, which is basically a giant arrow rocket that shoots off into the air, and then once it reaches Apogee, it shoots off more arrows that are on fire. I mean, that's just, it's incredible. I mean, we're working with the aerodynamics of a dragon head, we're working with rockets. All just really fascinating to me. They're, they're driving out to the middle of the Mojave Desert to film it. <laughs> yes, far, far away from here. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing uh, we're doing cliffhanger. We're doing uh, this at the end of cliffhanger. Sly is running across a rope bridge that blows up behind him, and he takes three more steps and then leaps. We're going to see how feasible that really is tomorrow. Um, yeah, tomorrow. I was actually looking at the bridge today, and thinking, I'm going to get on that tomorrow. That's actually <laughs> kind of scary. Um, we've also got one coming up uh, in April that I'm really looking forward to called Airplane Boarding Events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it turns out there's three ways to board airplanes. There's back to front, windows in, and then there's this new method, which is like a random distribution, windows in, but every sixth row, kind of. <laughs> now it turns out that back to front, you could fill a 100 seat plane in like seven minutes. Windows in, this is the research we're getting, windows in is like five minutes, and this new method is like three and a half minutes flat. But people who are doing the re that new method hate it because they can't tell what's going on. And it's a, it's, it's a totally natural human response. You're like, I don't know why I'm not joining, uh, getting on the plane with my wife. <laughs> because she's in the middle seat, you need to put your bed in, right? So this is, we're gonna do the whole gamut of, of which method works and how do people feel about it. We've just gotta find, does anyone here have a plane with 100 seats in it? <laughs> Turns out to be really hard to find and John Travolta won't return our calls. <laughs> So can you test it with um, people who are jerks and have too big a bag and don't get on to the very end? Well, no, actually what I was thinking of doing was choosing a random set. If we had 100 people, I would think that we'd take 20 of them and give them cards that gave them different personalities. Oh. Right? Like, you're, you, one of your legs doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> or your bag is filled with precious art your mother made and it's ceramic. Right, so we give, each, we give people these, 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 we make them into MacGuffins so they get to go up the works. You will not leave your husband, right? Like these kind of things. I, I think that absolutely we have to build those personality traits then. So who's going to be the extra flatulent guy that has the fast food bag? Because that's the one sitting next to me every single time. <laughs> All right, that's probably enough. <laughs> so I want to thank you for taking time away from your families. You are filming today, you're filming tomorrow, and it was very gracious of you to come to Dublin. And we hope to see you back uh, filming. And um, with that, I would like to bring up uh, Carol and the City of Dublin Mayor Tim to present some Dublin Gale swag. Let's make sure they fit. Thank you guys so much. We love you and we'll see you soon.